Good morning. So I wanted to talk a little bit about the upcoming Simbarum session and just cover uh, the basic mechanics uh, of the game and also rectify a uh, an error. So I said in my cheat sheet video and I uh, on my cheat sheet, my cheat sheet video for Simbarum that there are no stalemates in the combat for Simbarum. And that's it's not true. Um, you can <clears throat> miss your target on your turn. And uh, your assailant can miss you on their turn. So um, there, there is a I go, you go mentality. So we still have initiative. Uh, initiative is dictated by quickness, um, then vigilance. And then we roll a d20 if those things are tied. Um, so on your initiative turn, you make your decisions. You want to move, you want to combat, you want a free action, you want a reaction, whatever. Okay, You don't want a reaction. You will suffer. You, will, you are allowed a number of reactions based on how many people try to do things to you during your turn or during a turn, their turn, its turn. So there are stalemates. Um, I was thinking of Lone Wolf's single die roll system. In combat, there's never a stalemate. Either you damage the monsters or the monsters damage you. Um, so... Uh, I just wanted to clarify that. Um, so, um, so basically, it's a very simple system. It's a roll uh, equal to or under attribute check. You have eight attributes. Uh, combat is almost always accurate versus, uh, not versus, but then modified by your opponent's defense. Uh, and the other thing I love about Simba Room is you never modify the die roll. You modify the attributes. So when I say to Dell, when Dell attempts to curse an enemy in the in the in the game field on his turn, and he uh, he chooses to curse uh, an enemy, he needs to make uh, a roll his uh, um, uh, vigilance roll versus their I think it's uh, resolve no resolve versus resolve so his resolve attribute let's say it's I don't know what it is Dell's resolve attribute is. Uh, 15. So he needs to roll a 15 equal to or under 15. However, their resolve modifier. So let's say the resolve of the Queen's Rangers uh, is a, a minus three. He would subtract three from his 15. He needs to roll 12 or under. So anytime I say, well, add, add three to your resolve or minus one from your resolve, etc., you're literally taking it off of your attribute. You never modify the dice right so it's not minus one not minus two to the dice roll or plus three to the dice roll it is your attribute so your attribute will be shifted based on whether you're facing an, an opponent with an attribute that is really bad uh average or whatever or are really good so most things defense is going to be you know like a, a zero or maybe a plus one to a minus three on average right uh obviously some creatures have a plus like, like giant creatures are pretty easy to hit. So they might have a plus five defense adding to your accurate, right? So they're really easy to hit, but they they're, they might have a soak or a defense score that's harder to penetrate with your weapon. And I love that. I mean, I love the idea of, of being hit is not the same as our, our, uh, uh, your armor obviously playing a role in why you would wear armor. So the heavier your armor, the worse your defense, but the more protection you have. To me, that's that makes total sense, right? So your your raw quickness is your raw defense. The Im impediment of armor subtracts from your ability to avoid being hit, right? So uh, most ar light armor is going to be a minus two. All light armor is a minus two. So your average defense, let's say, is uh, ten uh, minus your armor eight. Eight and below is how they uh, you avoid being hit. Okay. So remember, uh, um, you always want to roll low for your success, whether the enemy is attacking you or whether you're attacking them, or you and you want to roll high anytime you're rolling on behalf of the creatures, right? So I think high is high is is bad for them, low is good for you, right? So pretty simple. Um, again, it's not complicated, but I thought I'd go over this. Uh, attack is generally your accurate versus their defensive modifier. Um, and again, what I mean by that is not their defensive attribute, their defensive attribute modifier. So like, like old D&D, &D, I might have an 18 strength, that's plus three to hit. Well, 
in this, uh, you know, 15 would be a minus five, right? A modifier. So uh, a pretty, pretty tough defense. So defend then is just the opposite. When you're defending yourself, it's your defense score modified by their accurate. So my defense is a, is a eight and their accurate is a um, uh, minus four, really accurate. Uh, they're really got a great accurate attribute. I'm, I'm, I, anything, right. It's going to be, uh, it's going to be difficult for me to defend myself, right. Because it's lowering my defense score. I got to roll under my defense score. Right. So um, they don't, they don't roll to, to hit you. You roll to defend yourself. Right. So when I narrate that the giant picks his hands up and he's coming down to, to, you know, to, to crush you, you're rolling to successfully defend yourself, roll out of the way or shield up or whatever, right? So I, I dig that, right? You always want to run low. That's it. All there is to it, right? Uh, so you can see it's, it's uh, 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 that's why the armor hurts your ability to avoid being hit, but it gives you some protection, right? Makes sense. So you don't want a low defense score, right? You want a high defense score. All right, uh, what else? Uh, I'm only going to use one optional rule from the GM's options, and that is instant kill. No other optional rule. So we aren't going to have perfect hits. We're not going to have perfect. We're not going to have fumbles. I, I don't. I don't dislike perfect hits. The idea of a critical hit. I. I I'm. I'm definitely as a GM uh, and a player adverse to fumbles. Fumbles tend to create clowns. They tend to create moments of levity that I don't want. Certainly in my gritty dark. Now, I mean, if we're just playing a beer and pretzel, let's go have fun. Yeah, fumbles are fun. But something like Symborum, I'm not looking to see characters fumbling, right? Um, but I also don't really want to see perfect hits. So we're not going to use perfect hits. We're not going to use persuasion against other players, uh, characters. So character versus character persuasion checks. So there's quite a few optional things there. But I will use instant kill. And again, instant kill... Uh, only occurs if you hit zero and they breach your pain threshold, okay? So let's say I have two toughness left and the creature hits me causing two damage. Uh, my pain threshold is four. I would be at zero and dying. I would not be instantly killed, right? Uh, they would have to breach my pain threshold of four. So they would have to get a four or better for me to be instantly killed on that strike, okay? So then we still we're still going to end up making our death rolls, and on uh, at the beginning of every turn on your initiative, you roll that d twenty, and it's going to decide whether you live, die, or stabilize, etc. Well, normally it's not stabilization; it's generally you're hovering, you're dead, you're alive, or you've got one more roll before you die. It'll tell you on the chart you, you get one more, and then you're dead. So, uh, but that also gives the people in their on their turn initiative wise, a chance to get to you and stabilize. So it's, it's, it, it just, it, it, it lowers the lethality a, a little bit. Right. Okay. What else? Um, I think that's really it. Uh, remember that if you use sneaking is a good example. If I use, if I want to, if you want as a player to sneak against the guard, it's your discrete attribute against their vigilant modifier vice versa if you are trying to see somebody sneaking against you it's your vigilance attribute against their discreet modifier they're trying to be discreet and trick you or sneak up on you and vice versa you're trying to be discreet and they're vigilant so vigilant is really observation discreet of course is sneaking pickpocketing you know doing discreet things vigilance is seeing things etc a uh, quickness is generally defense and initiative Accurate is almost all weapons. Uh, accurate is melee and missile, right? So we don't have two different attributes for combat. Uh, and then, of course, we have strength or strong. And then we have, uh, oh, gosh, what else? Persuasive, right? So, again, I love the fact that the attributes really inform those those intimidation checks, uh, 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 barter checks, etc. So our attributes are where everything falls. Then, of course, we have traits, which affect game. We have abilities, which affect game. And we have uh, mystical powers for mystics, which can be rituals or um, uh, 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 like spells, etc. So almost all rituals take about an hour. So characters that want to use a ritual 
spell, they're actually going to have to set up time. They're going to have to, you know, this is the kind of thing they would have to do before they, they, they proceed. Might something might they might do at the campsite. Something they might do before they enter a ruin or something. One of the characters might say, "I'm going to meditate" or "I'm going to do, I'm going to perform the ritual to activate the thing." So most rituals take time, and 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 you should have some narrative description of what your character learned. For instance, Dell has a ritual of uh, uh, foreshadowing. It takes about an hour. He would have to. He's learned this from somebody else. Uh, he's self. So Dell's character is a self-taught mystic, which means somewhere along the lines in his travels, he learned this um, uh, for uh, for fortune telling. Excuse me, fortune telling, um, and uh, it would allow him once per adventure to ask me a yes or no question about the adventure. Example: He narrates how he's sketching out on the ground with a stick the 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 pentagram or whatever he does the the oval with the cross through it and then he kneels in it and meditates and 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 speaks some you know gibberish and then at some point uh uh right he's conducted the ritual and uh he'll ask me a simple yes no question to give them a hint about the adventure can't do it again unless something major changes the directions of the adventure. So then ultimately he says to me, Jason, uh, are we headed in the right direction? That's a yes, no question. Yep. Nope. Right. Or, or is there, uh, it'd be something as simple as um, will, uh, I don't know, would have I'd try, I can't think of something somebody would ask yes or no right offhand. Um, is, is, did, did Sarah go into this ruin? Yes, no. And they would, and I could say yes, and they would know Sarah's somewhere in the ruins and they got to go find her, right? That kind of thing. But anyway, uh, so I just want to talk a little bit about this. Very, it's really, really simple. Um, generally, like I said before, uh, Dell will have stuff like the resolute for his cursing. So he wants to curse somebody. And by the way, the other thing that's really cool about Symborum is they break the game into interludes, scenes, and turns. We only use turns in combat. So if any spell, trait, or ability talks about turns in their description, they are combat ability. So Dell, for instance, has curse at adept. He's at second level. So instead of doing two, I made a character for Dell. So instead of Dell having two mystical powers, he has curse at the adept level. So he has one, but it's at the second level adept. Curse allows him to make a resolute versus resolute check against a target, and that target has to roll twice in any attempt of a, an act and uh, take the worst roll. So in a way, it causes them. So then let's say he curses uh, 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 an elf uh, ranger that's firing uh, on on um, Justin's character, and he makes the resolute check uh, and he succeeds. He's concentrating. That's going to stay true through the whole combat unless he loses his resolve. So in the next round, he just has to make sure he doesn't lose that uh, next resolve test. And he can continue to basically stare at this creature and curse them. That creature rolls uh, uh, Dustin's defense. You know, he's defending himself against arrows that are coming from, uh, or, uh, you know, uh, from the woods. Dustin makes a, a roll and it's unfortunate. He rolls a 20, which means he's gonna take damage. But because the ranger's cursed, we roll again. He takes the worst roll. Justin, let's say, rolls a three on this roll. Fortunately, uh, the curse just off the mark as J uh, Justin's character gets his shield up or steps out of the way of the arrow as it hits the tree, whatever, right? So, uh, and he can hold that curse. Um, with Adept, he can hold that curse on anyone, targeting anyone. With uh, Novice, he can only curse people targeting him. Right. But with adept, he can target anyone he wants to, which is cool. So my point is this. Dell could not use curse in a scene in which they are bartering uh, or they are negotiating with a barbarian or they're negotiating with the rangers or something that he can't use curse in those situations. Right. A scene is different than turns. Turns are combat. So it's kind of neat too. I like that idea that we are uh, identifying whether something is useful all the time, whether something's useful uh, in combat. So there you have it. Scenes can be initiated by GM. Generally by GM will initiate scenes, but characters, players can initiate scenes as well. 
Um, you know, we're, we're in an interlude. I'm describing how the game starts. I describe where they're at, what's going on. And then uh, let's say uh, I, 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 I present, I will open up, by the way, presenting them in a situation, not in media res, but an interlude. Uh, and how where they're at and what's going on right now. And then Justin may initiate a scene by saying, I want to talk to that guy, right? Or I want to, right? Or David might initiate a scene by saying, I want to sneak around this thing and look it over first, investigate. He would initiate in a way, a scene in which there might be a dice check, not necessarily a scene that I've prepared, right? Okay. So players can initiate scenes uh, as well as, uh, as well as GMs, right? So scenes are more or less where there might be a conflict, there might be a dice check. And then of course there's combat, which is uh, a no brainer. It's going to be, it's going to be turns until, uh, you know, people die or until people surrender or until, until people evade, uh, flee, etc. So just not that complicated. Uh, I don't anticipate we're all going to have everything down and memorized when it comes to traits and it comes to uh abilities but we're just going to talk about those things and share those things I'm, i'll probably use the book i'll have the book open to make sure i know how justin's rituals work or david's characters uh the stuff functions uh because again i haven't done this in a couple of years with some borum and i want to i want to really learn the game and make sure we get the game right so really the gist of this is uh for the for all of my players come saturday night the only optional rule we will use is instant kill and remember, instant kill, you don't die at zero unless they unless the final blow is over your pain threshold. Then you would die instantly. If not, you're still going to get your death tests. And I'm okay with that, right? I'm okay with that. Uh, this is one of those games where where uh, your attributes max out. Uh, it, you're not really going to improve your hit points ever in Symborum, right? I mean, if, you're, if your strength attribute is seven, you automatically get 10 toughness you're going to pretty much stay at 10 toughness. So the game's always fairly lethal that way, right? And then there's armor and defense and all those great things. Uh, long weapons. Uh, long weapons are pretty cool because they give you automatic initiative, right? It's certainly at the beginning. So if you have not engaged in melee and we start launching and you have a long weapon, you generally are going to get to go first. However, that's not necessarily true on the next round because we're in melee. You have to actually move out um, uh, uh, of distance to get that free attack again at long range. And one of the observations when I did my video, uh, one of the players say, I really hate when, when, when there's this opportunity attacks against people moving out of combat. And I agree with that in general, but going over the rules again this week, I realized there are way too many free actions that and, and there are traits and things that affect the free actions and we cannot unfortunately change that rule. We cannot say you can move out of combat without a free attack against you because it changes other tactical things that could occur in the game. For instance, uh, uh, summer elves have a tactic. Their tactic is use their long spears in melee. But they will tactically, uh, once you're engaged, they'll use the long spears to get a free attack. Then they'll tactically try to move back so they can get another free attack at the top of the next turn. Well, for them to move out of melee, that lets the players get a free attack. So if we change that retreating free attack action against something like the summer elves, the early summer elves, or uh, not all the elves do that, but these particular summer elf, uh, elves do, then it negates, it negates, it makes it easy for me just to back out of combat every turn without, without paying a price. And getting a, a free long attack at the start of every initiative phase. So there has to be some drawback for me to successfully move out of melee with these elves, right? Vice versa, right? So uh, if you want to keep getting the free action attack with your long weapon, you have to always move back to move back on your turn because you could attack, then move back. So you'll get initiative on the next turn. Those enemies get a free shot at you if they're engaged, by the way, but if they're engaged, okay? The other reason we have to leave that rule in, despite whether we like it or not, is tactically, anytime you have two characters on something, you're considered flanked, which gives both those characters advantage. Advantage in Symborum is very, very easy. Advantage is a plus two to your attribute. 
So Dell is and and David are surrounding a summer elf. Elf. They have advantage. They've basically considered flanking this summer elf in melee. Okay, plus two to uh, to David's accurate melee attacks. Plus two to Dell's accurate melee attacks. Right to their attribute score against this creature's defensive abilities. Right, that's pretty significant. You can have up to four enemies surrounding one enemy. So you can see now why it is it's important we don't just change the rules and throw out that those opportunity attacks if you try to back out of combat. And I'm in I'm in total agreement as somebody who's been in combat sports, uh, wrestling and boxing. Uh, there are one on one. There are tactical ways you can back up and and not suffer an easy shot. I mean it's I totally agree with that. But in a melee combat with three or four combatants and a busy crowded, um, I, you know, I'm I'm not one to just change the rules there. So we will play that rules as written. If you try to back out of combat, your opponent will get a free attack on you. So be aware of that we won't change that rule. And that's really all I have to talk about for our upcoming Saturday game. I look forward to this. This is, uh, and I've talked about it now multiple times. Every time I mention Symborum, I'd say this. It's my favorite modern fantasy game. And it is. And I cannot wait to do this. So anyway, I wanted to make this video. Um, again, I don't believe in uh, fumbles. So we will have no rolls of 20 or a fumble. I don't, I don't like turning the player characters into clowns. I don't like the game reducing itself uh, to... Uh, to, to, you know, I, I really prefer Gravitas, especially when I run a serious, gritty, dark game. I like Gravitas. So I don't like, and I just don't like the idea of characters fumbling. Um, player characters are, they don't have to be heroes. They aren't, they don't have to be, uh, you know, we don't have to play superhero characters. We don't have to play, uh, uh, but I think punishing players for rolling a 20 uh, or a one in old school D&D. To me, it's just, it's just, it, it always ends up degrading the game into, or, or, or degrading the characters into. So like Dark Age of Man, we have critical successes and critical failures, but a critical failure uh, is defined in the game as to what happens. A critical failure generally causes the monster to do poison or causes the assassin to, or, or uh, you know, uh, it, it'll trigger something. A critical failure in combat in our game doesn't fumble the player it triggers some monster ability right and in our game uh critical success and critical failure should change the circumstances or trigger a thing as opposed to making a, a, a character the butt of a joke so i don't like the idea of fumbling perfect hits critical hits are always cool because when you roll a 20 in D, D, everybody knows that 20 is fat it's just this kind of dramatic wow you know that's a double damage or whatever but again, in Symborum, I think there's so many other ways your characters can be successful, utilizing stuff like purses, et cetera, that I really don't want to mess around with those optional rules. So so the guys know that's where we're headed. Anyway, uh, and then I'm running this session. I believe David will probably run the second session. And then David, of course, will be free to pick what optional rules uh, David wants to, 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 to uh, uh, put in, in his game too. But right now, all I want is to see uh, instant kill. And instant kill does not mean you're dead at zero unless your pain threshold is uh, – unless they hit you hard enough that it, it it would be a pain threshold attack. Then it's a killing blow. It's one of these dreadful, through the heart, head uh, decapitated. I mean, it would be one of these – it would be uh, it would be catastrophic. You're dead. Outside of that, you would still fall, and then you would make a couple of death tests. Uh, hopefully, you would get at least two dull rolls. You, if you roll that fat 20 – or whatever it is, I think it's 20. Yeah, if you roll that 20 on your first death test, you're dead. So you'd bleed out basically or something. So, all right, everybody out there, thank you for watching. Again, um, yes, we are talking a lot about some Borum of late because we are planning some games. I'm running a game and David will probably run a game. Uh, so, um, and I'm planning on running really two things over the next few months. I want to run Dark Age of Man. Uh, I want to play in Dark Age of Man, and I want to run some Borum and play in some Borum. Those are the two things I'm planning on running, at least. I'll play in almost anything people invite me to play in. But when it comes to what I'm going to run in the next few months, it's going to be just these two games for right now. Um, I'm really hoping to play a lot more uh, in something like uh, Dark Age of Man and some Borum. I want to enjoy the player seat a little more. And I want to see how other GMs, other people handle 
uh, and enjoy or don't enjoy our presenter seat, our naive narrated presenter seat in Dark Age of Man. I'm really curious to see how other GMs, uh, uh, you know, do it and whether they like it or whether they think it's, uh, you know, I think it's just going to be interesting to see how other other people handle the presenter seat in our game. So thank you for watching. Goodbye.